Paul, Jack Rimbeggs, Tōku Ingoa. Great to see so many people hanging in there. Awesome, folks. Uh, so, oh, let's have a little bit. Do this whole glasses thing. All right, so um, I've been working on Introduced Social Wasps for virtually my entire professional career, so about 40 years, I'm sad to say. Obviously, I started super young. Um, so uh, really what I wanted to do today was cover some of the breadth of what we've learnt about social wasps in New Zealand um, over the decades. Uh, and I know you're going off, um, some of you, to talk about wasp control specifically um, afterwards. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions ar uh, around this. Uh, but basically I'm going to talk a little bit about wasps uh, in New Zealand, why we think they're so bad, a little bit about their biology and their impact, and then talk about a little bit about the control towards the end. So we have about half an hour to crack through all of that. So it's a little bit of once over lightly, but as I say, if there's anything specific you want to know, um, I'm planning on leaving time for questions afterwards. So, introduce wasps in New Zealand. So New Zealand, um, unusually around the globe, has no native social wasps or bees, uh, and only 11 species of ant, which is actually a ridiculous small diversity of social hymenoptera that are naturally in New Zealand. Uh, and that actually has a lot of consequences for us in uh, managing uh, these species. Uh, and, uh, but I'm only going to focus on, um, obviously, the social wasps at, at the moment. All right, so in terms of introduced social wasps, what do we have in New Zealand? Uh, we have three species of pilistes or paper wasps, and you know those ones because as they're flying along, their legs are dangling down. So if you see something flying with dangling legs at about wasp size, it will be an introduced paper wasp. So until a few years ago, the story was there's only two species of paper wasp in New Zealand, the Asian paper wasp, which is sort of um, the yellow and black sort of traditional colours of a, of a wasp, and then we have the Australian paper wasp, which actually arrived uh, in New Zealand, was one of the first arrivals, and it's been here for ages, and is only found in the northern North Island. And that's more of a brownie colour. Uh, but in 2016, uh, we have the arrival of the European paper wasp, um, and it was first detected in Nelson, uh, but we know now that it is in Auckland, been keeping a little bit of an eye out from it, but it's actually incredibly similar visually to uh, what the Asian paper wasp looks like. So you've got to really um, look very closely to distinguish between the two. Uh, but potentially we will see more of that European uh, paper wasp uh, throughout New Zealand. And that species is one of the really problematic species over in North America, so it's introduced to North America as well, um, and they've been having quite a few problems with it. But what I'm mostly going to focus about in this talk are, are our two species of Vespular wasps, so the German wasp, which arrived um, uh, at the end of the Second World War, and the common wasp, which arrived sometime in the late 1970s, we never were quite sure exactly when. So one of the things, uh, one of the more recent bits of uh, work that was done was looking at the um, uh, genetic diversity of these two introduced uh, vespular wasps, the German and the common wasp, just to see if we could get a handle on how often did they arrive into New Zealand how many uh, introduction events were there. And so this was analysis where um, colleagues led by Phil Lester um, got samples of wasps from around the world, um, Europe being their native range and the others uh, mostly their uh, introduced range. And you can see New Zealand there, but I can't point easily, can I? Nope, never mind. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, so the German wasp, you can see New Zealand is the lower curve there. Argentina um, was even lower. But New Zealand, it looks like the German wasp only came in twice into New Zealand. 
Uh, and the fact that the curve is flattened off uh, suggests that more sampling wouldn't detect more incursions. It probably was around about two. Uh, on the other hand, the common wasp on the other side, uh, we know that there's likely to have been at least six uh, introduction events, uh, but the fact that the curve is still quite high suggests that if we did more sampling, we might find um, a bit more diversity. So these things are coming into the country, and it wasn't just one incursion. Um, they're, they're continuing to get in, and as indeed the arrival of um, the new species of paper wash shows, you know, even new species are potentially coming in. So keep your eyes open out there, uh, because all of these detections were made by members of the public or introduced, uh, um, you know, people with their eyes open out there on the ground rather than any sort of systematic survey. So if you see something that looks really different, possibly it is. Um, similarly, some work uh, on uh, looking at genetic <coughs> diversity to try and pinpoint, you know, where in Europe were these uh, things coming from. So this was work led by uh, one of my PhD students, Julia Schmack, uh, and she found that um, it was highly likely that the Vespula germanica had originated somewhere in the UK, which kind of makes sense. Uh, and uh, But for the common wasp, uh, she didn't really know. So she'd done quite a bit of, um, it, it was harder to get samples from across Europe and nothing match uh, particularly well. Um, what we do know, though, is that um, even though we might have had two or six introductions of these species, uh, they have been through a major uh, bottleneck, and so the sort of diversity patterns across New Zealand that we hope we might be able to use to look at internal structuring of the population in the way that uh, Andrew was talking about with um, Stokes earlier, um, there's just not enough uh, diversity that we could pick it up using those techniques at this stage. Um, the pathogens um, is an interesting story because, you know, these things in Europe, it's likely that there's all sorts of things that um, attack wasps and help keep them in control. Uh, but again, until we had some of these fancy molecular tools, we weren't really able to get much of a handle on that. Um, but the more recent work um, again shows that there's lots of different um, pathogens, particularly bacteria, but also um, fungi and nematodes, that are coming in, and they are in our system here in more or less similar uh, amounts of diversity as what we would see over in their native range um, in Europe. Uh, and one of the reasons we think that is, is that they're sharing a lot of um, pathogens with honeybees, and of course we have honeybees all over the show, and so um, not only are honeybees likely acting as a reservoir of disease for Vespula, but vice versa, um, potentially Vespula acting as a reservoir of disease for honeybees. Not all that surprising, given they're relatively closely related. Uh, so this is um, moving now on to um, the abundance and uh, distribution in a, um, looking across the top of the North Island. A lot of our earlier work was all done in those South Island uh, beach forests, but since I moved up here about 20 odd years ago, uh, we wanted to have a look um, more broadly at what was happening um, across um, the, this sort of landscape, where we don't have the beach forest with sugar's dripping with honey water. Um, and so Yulia, um, for her PhD, had the lucky job of um, going and visiting 36, 36 offshore islands, um, ranging from North Island, uh, sorry, Mare Island, um, right the way up um, the east coast of the North Island. Um, and the first thing we had to do when we were doing that work was develop a, a whole new way of indexing wasp numbers because all of our previous methodology was um, designed around the density of wasps that we see in the South Island Beach Forest, which is an order of magnitude higher than what we see up here. And so trying to um, detect um, them needed a much more sensitive our way of doing this. So we came up with the five minute wasp count 
um, sort of modelled off the five minute uh, bird count. Anyway, that put, proved a really uh, useful tool and so she was able to go out and index the abundance of all four, at that stage it was all four species of social wasp in New Zealand on these different islands and then um, play around with some mathematical models looking up, you know, what were the main drivers of um, the distribution and abundance of those species. So the first thing um, wasn't particularly uh, surprising. Um, almost all of those islands had at least one species and usually more of social wasp. The only island that didn't have any social wasp that we could detect using our methods anyway uh, was our Rangi in the Poor Knights Islands. Um, but I think probably what was most surprising to me was the density of the paper wasps on those offshore islands. I expected high numbers of vespula, but actually we were de detecting equally high abundance of paper wasps across everywhere. It didn't matter how far out we were, uh, there were paper wasps. Then the other thing that Yulia did was, um, again, using able to use these uh, uh, fancier uh, molecular tools is she we wanted to have a crack at well we we had some earlier information using the uh, you know collect and 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 take the food off the returning vesicle to see what they were eating but by m using molecular tools we were able to um, collect a profile of what they were eating across the season because the wasps are in a nest and by and when the larvae um, developing larvae poop, it's not lost, it's collects at the bottom of the cells, so we can find the nest, collect the, the poop that's accumulated over the season, and it gives us a picture of, of what they're eating. And by going out to Ahu Ahu, um, or Great Mercury Island, which had uh, the two vesicular species and uh, both Palistes species, uh, we were able to compare what those different um, uh, species were eating. So first she surveyed the whole island to find out where they were and there was a lot of spatial structuring of where they were so it was the Vespula vulgaris that was that was the triangles that are, are mostly um, in the uh, forested area. Interestingly the um, most mature na and intact native <coughs> forest area which is that really small slither of dark green about um, you know, a third of, uh, two thirds of uh, the island on the east coast there, there were no wasps in there. One of the messages, and again that came out of the broader um, uh, distribution work that uh, Yulia was doing on all those other islands, is if you have intact native forests in those systems, the wasp numbers drop right away. So if you really, really want to control wasps on those offshore islands, get the native vegetation back. Easy. Well, not quite so easy, but <laughs> it seemed like a nice way forward. Anyway, she was also looking then at the diet of, of what those things were doing. Um, and so I'm going to show you some relatively complex figures, but you don't have to take in all the detail. You just have to look at the pretty patterns. Um, so there's our four species of introduced wasp along the top and along the bottom. Um, uh, the different types of invertebrates they were collecting, so Lepidoptera are the, um, mostly the moths and butterflies, the Diptera are the flies, the Hymenoptera are other um, wasps and bees, um, Hymiptera are true bugs, Aranae the spiders and then others. So you can see lots of interactions. So the um, Although we tend to think of some of these things as being relatively specialist, and certainly the paper wasps tend to eat more Lepidoptera, the, the moths and butterflies, than anything else, there's actually a lot of diversity. But if you use um, the fancy uh, statistical methods to, to drill down into that, what was happening is that they were actually complementing each other on what they were eating. So the short message is, the more species that you add in, the broader range of insect taxa they were really being targeted. So it's not a substitutional thing, it's an additional thing. As you add in more introduced wasps, you're affecting more and more 
um, of our native um, invertebrates. And that's telling the same story at a wider scale. So if there's one diagram that uh, summarises many decades of work, it's this one. Uh, so we have our introduced wasps, and this is talking primarily about the vespular wasps in the centre there. And we know, um, particularly in those uh, southern beach forests, that honeydew is a really important driver of, this whole, of the whole abundance of wasps. And we know that's produced by endemic scale insects that are feeding on the beech trees. But what we've found over the years is, it's, you know, not surprising as an ecologist, this is all interlinked. So the honeydew is driving um, the microbial systems, which is influencing the nutrient cycling. And so the wasp taking away the honeydew is influencing the nutrient cycling of the forest. We certainly know there's major impacts on the invertebrates. We never quite pin down statistically the impact on birds because there's so much else going on in those forests. You know, there's rats, there's does, there's possums, etc. So it's really hard at a landscape level to pick apart, you know, attribute the different um, invasive species impact in some of those systems. Uh, but I would say it's highly likely that they are because they're having such an impact um, directly on the invertebrates. So I think one of the reasons that wasps are so problematic in these systems are because they are impacting at multiple levels. It's not just that they're predators and taking out nestling birds or invertebrates, but they are also influencing the nutrient cycling in the system. Um, they are affecting um, at such a diff number of different levels um, that it's kind of um, <coughs> exacerbates the impact they're having at, at any one thing. Right, I'm going to flip now to um, briefly just uh, cover off the control work we're doing. So poison baiting. Uh, is the, and this is the result of many, many years of work of trying different baits, different um, toxins, and particularly the holy grail was to try and find something that affected the wasp but didn't target the honeybees. Pretty difficult to do, except by the bait. If you use a protein bait, uh, then the wasp will come, but the bees won't. So that is the main thing that uh, makes, it, uh, makes it safe to use around honeybees. Um, and it can be incredibly effective, providing the wasps are introduced in the protein bait. In a southern beech forest, no problem. The systems are loaded with sugar, and so protein is, you know, one of the key limiting factors. Up in the north, different. It flips around and it makes it a lot trickier. Um, because you don't have that abundance of sugar, and so it's often sugar that's limiting. So they're on the hunt for sugar, and they get pretty sniffy about protein baits at times. Doesn't mean they won't take a protein bait, but just it can be harder to um, find the, the window when they, that's what they're most interested in. Um, not much at the moment we can do to get around that. You can't flip to a um, sugar bait in um, these forests, which would be the ideal, because of the risk to honeybees. So stuck with using a protein bait. Um, at the moment, um, fipronil is uh, what is primarily used. There's likely other toxins at work, but there's not been a necessarily um, a strong need to develop other toxins at the moment, because there's more pressing, pressing, pressing issues. Um, so that works really well for vespula, in, in most circumstances. Uh, paper wasps, uh, we have no current tools other than finding the nest and clipping it off or spraying all the wood there directly because they don't scavenge, they'll only target live prey. So you can't put out cat food or whatever and think that paper wasps are going to come to that. So there's a long story that I'm not going to bore you with around getting um, a product to market. Uh, but we do now have in uh, New Zealand uh, Vespex wasp bait, which is basically um, 
that protein bait mixed with the fit granola. It's commercially available and I'm sure that um, most of you um, either know of it or have even used it. How many in the audience have used best specs at this point? Yeah. How many found it effective? <laughs> Super effective? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, if you were in the South Island beach for us, I'm sure everybody that had used it would go, yes, yes, it's awesome. <coughs> the difficulty up here is always going to be that issue around protein bait versus them wanting sugar. Um, so biological control um, is, uh, you know, again, there's been a lot of work done on this over the years. We've released, and sorry, these don't have common names. Um, Svekabaga visparum visparum is itself a um, wasp, a small uh, parasitic wasp that's really effective um, in some cases, but as it turns out in the long run in New Zealand, it hasn't done all that well. It's established, which is a good start, um, but after 20 odd years of monitoring what it was doing, um, we had to con conclude that it's not really delivering any significant control at the population level. Uh, and the other species uh, that was released um, didn't even establish, Svekafaga visparum burra. Um, so that one was in the failed camp. Uh, so Landcare Research, um, under the leadership of Bob Brown, um, is doing quite a lot of more work um, around alternative biocontrol agents going back to the original Svekafaga visparum visparum, but seeing if they can get better um, matching in terms of climatic zones and things. Sometimes that's been super effective, is just to go look at where you were originally collected from and go, well, actually, that wasn't the best match. The original Svekafaga um, that was um, released actually only came from a single nest in Switzerland. <laughs> Uh, so it certainly seems worthwhile to me to go back and see if um, a little bit more diversity within that species might give a better outcome. Uh, and then he's tried um, a couple of species of drone fly and beetles, so watch that space. Okay, so what we do know after decades of work is that um, in many situations that uh, wasps are having a mass massive ecological impact, uh, and that we know that um, what humans have done in terms of uh, shaping the environment and helping move these things around, dispersing them into new areas, adding in new species, keeps coming um, <coughs> along to make the problem even worse. Uh, then we know that um, you know there are some things that we could play with there, such as the cover of um, vegetation on um, some of these offshore islands. Poison baiting um, is currently the most effective uh, control tool, but it's certainly not a silver bullet. We need another, other ways of doing this. Um, but I would say if you're going to be planning these things, um, we're not looking at eradication, obviously in this case, we're looking at control, uh, then you do need to think um, of uh, a multiple range of things that are that are interplaying. So for instance, we know that the queen wasps um, can fly between 30 and 70 kilometers in a year. So they have this dispersal phase. They've already mated and then they go off and um, over winter. And so if you're looking at um, you know, the scale of what needs to be achieved, then that would suggest you need to be uh, thinking of more than just your little backyard. Okay, so I'm happy to take uh, questions at this point. Yep. Two, two questions, probably quite easy. 